To the bicycle industry and members of the MBDA community, thank you for watching this very special recording of a conversation today with Erin Staley, Director of Education at Quality Bicycle Products, and Jeff Donaldson, BBI Institute School Director, who also leads all technical training at the U of Q, QBP, centered around service departments and profitability. The MBDA is extremely thankful to the team at QBP and their continued support not only of the MBDA, but retailers and the industry at large. One of the few, if not only, certified B Corps in the industry, QBP continues to support positive movements within the industry, all that lead to impactful change. Things continue to evolve at record pace with rapid changes demanding us to stay focused on the collective movements of the industry. Retailers must position themselves to be ready to respond to rapidly changing environments. They have to not only be focused on their business finances and profitability, but every aspect of their business from staffing, supplier relationships, and service. As president of MBDA, I am able to connect with retailers daily and learn more about the items that are facing you firsthand. As of late, the topic of the Bicycle Retail Service Center has come up often with conversations between retailers focused on staffing, turnaround, pricing, layout, specific repairs, concerning e-bikes, paper versus paperless, scheduling appointments, and more. Hoping to provide resources and guidance around these topics came the idea of today's conversation. I am so thankful to Aaron and Jeff for joining me today and willing to sit down to answer some questions that retailers and other members of our industry have sent me that they're interested in learning more about. Aaron and Jeff, thank you for joining me. It's such an important topic, right? Absolutely. Thanks for having us today. I am just so, thanks, I just reached out to you and the three of us put our brains together. Um, we just solicited all these questions from our members and they came in pretty rapidly. And um, we put together what I think is the guts for a great conversation. Um, before we get moving, I thought I would just do some intros and uh, maybe you could give us our listeners a little bit more about your current role. Jeff, can I start with you? Sure thing. Uh, I'm Jeff Donaldson. I'm the school director at uh, U of Q Institute. Um, we're based in Colorado Springs and uh, we are uh, tasked with training professional mechanics in the bicycle industry. Um, like everybody else, we've been challenged by COVID, although probably in a, a bit of a different way. Um, being a school, we've had real capacity and concerns with getting close to one another, but um, here we are and moving forward through this this crazy time. Thanks, Jeff. And just a side note, I should let everyone know, Jeff and Aaron not only are doing this program today with the MBDA, but they continue to meet with me almost bi-weekly to learn um, all the things that retailers are facing to see how they can help uh, provide in this critical environment we're in. So thanks, Jeff. And Aaron, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Aaron Staley. I'm the Director of Education at QBP. And what that is, I oversee uh, a team of events and education experts. So uh, Jeff's team at the Institute for technical training, uh, our events team at Fr uh, Thinking Frostbite or UQ Brand Camp, and then also our demo team. So if there's an educational component um, or an educational experience like an event, uh, my team oversees and, and creates those opportunities for retailers to learn and grow. Awesome. Thank you, Erin. So, so Jeff, I'm sure you're communicating with retailers daily as you form programs to train and educate service techs. Can you speak on what you are seeing in service that may be unique now compare, compared to, let's say, a year or 18 months ago? Um, I think the biggest thing that stands out to me is just the sheer demand that service departments are under right now. Uh, how businesses are, are handling that and how uh, uh, employees are entering the industry is, is pretty far and wide. Um, but everybody is, is taxed and overloaded and, um, and really uh, having to think differently. Um, I think it, it's a really great opportunity that stores are in to start rethinking uh, how they do service because that's a massive touch point that we can all affect here. Um, but it, it's it, the, the sheer demand is the, the bottom line right now. Yeah, I think that definitely falls in line with what I'm hearing from retailers and um, it's so important that we focus on this today. Erin, we are talking about service center profitability. 
I know you're so involved with the educational component, um, helping retailers dial in their operations. You know, in your, in your words, why is this so critical uh, a time to be thinking about service center profitability and how often should retailers be reviewing their service area? Yeah, absolutely. This is a passion of mine and, and really why I led the, the drive to create U of Q Service Summit, which is around service center profitability and best practices uh, from a leadership standpoint. Uh, service is going to always be a consistent, no matter what you know, commerce landscape exists, people still need service of their bicycles. And that is something that you provide uh, your customers. And so knowing that that will always remain, uh, you need to really pay attention to what decisions you're making, what processes you're putting in place. And that's always going to be the backbone of how your business is operating because that can lead to so many different experiences or relationships that have value to your business. So really, why is it important to pay attention to your profitability? Well, because by knowing and understanding your metrics, you're making in intentional decisions and goals. And without paying attention to those pieces, you can't actually set a goal or make a decision with any sort of certainty um, those are just assumptions and guesses at that point. And so in order to be able to control your business and to control the desired performance of how it's providing to the, the bottom line, you need to really look at the profitability and understand what those metrics are. Um, I always recommend an annual review uh, with little milestones set along the way, uh, depending on what your goals and, and needs are. And then every two to three years doing a, a really deep dive. Um, because if you look at it year to year, that's important, but those are micro adjustments and could be a little reactionary. So if you set, you know, these milestones with a longer term goal for a deep evaluation, you can see the collective impact that these decisions have made over a more realistic time frame for these to, to set into effect. So, um, yeah, once every couple of years with annual review periods uh, and adjustments as needed. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, I think it was just a couple of days ago, we were having a conversation about uh, Frostbike and Cabda and the topics that we want to have with the retailers there. And we think we dove into a little bit about even how like the price of a wheel true uh, or how you price a wheel true and how important it is not just to do it off the cusp, but really have a metric and doing it really based on profitability. And I hope we get into that conversation a little bit um, because it's not just you know, copying what the shop next door is doing that's going to make your service center profitable. There's a lot more to it. So um, I totally agree with you. And, I, you know, I'm so happy that we're having this conversation. I can't wait. This is going to be fun. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier, I just sort of pegged retailers and I said, hey, I'm sitting down with the team at, at QBP and I want to bring up some questions about profitability. What do you have? What do you want to know? What would you like us to ask? And I got lots of questions back. So I'm just gonna dive into those and I guess Jeff, Aaron, whoever wants to tackle them, feel comfortable to jump in, okay? Sounds great. Yeah. Uh, so now in your respective roles, how are you staying in touch with retailers? Just to give us like a little bit, how, how do you go visit shops? Are you talking with retailers weekly? Like how often are you, um, you know, chatting so you're really up to speed on what's happening at the shop level? Uh, from my end of things, it's pretty consistent. I mean, we've got a we've got a pretty steady stream of students through the the building, and that lets me um, have some pretty good conversations with uh, with people daily. If I miss something the first day, they're going to be there the second day. So it's it's nice to be able to follow up. Um, we are also, you know, we're in touch with with businesses um, both on the retail and the supply side pretty frequently, and I think the way that we're starting conversations is pretty similar to everybody is, you know, how are you doing? What's happening? <laughs> what, what are you doing now? And, um, you always have that five or 10 minute debrief before you get to what you were originally talking about. So, uh, it, it remains pretty consistent, um, in speaking with people in the industry. I feel pretty fortunate. I'm going on my 20th, 
third year in the industry and you know as you can imagine you develop a lot of relationships in that time and having the network and support that QVP has developed uh, by being in the position we're in uh, really provides a lot of relationships and opportunities to connect with organizations like MBDA or People for Bikes at a high level. Uh, manufacturers, we have so many relationships with where we get insight on what trends and, and future opportunities are presenting themselves. And then just this vast network of retailers that either we have relationships with or our peers and teammates internally at QVP have relationships with. So there's never um, a dead end uh, when seeking information. There's always someone that we can reach out to and investigate what's going on. Uh, and, and often uh, it's quite humbling that people are excited more than not to, to speak to us. And the fact that QVP has presented that reputation that we get to continue on is a lot of fun and it really makes me motivated to to dig deeper and continue to find that next relevant topic to develop for the institute or an education event yeah and i have to be honest that was my question and i wanted to ask it because i wanted our <laughs> listeners to know that you guys are really the experts like i really want to say when, when it talks about service center profitability when it talks when we talk about training your service technicians when we talk about trends, when we talk about the future, your reputation stands so super highly respected within the industry. And that's why we're talking today. And that's why you guys are on here. So that was my question. Thanks for letting me ask you. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, we talk about service in general, uh, bicycle repair service. In your opinion, what service industry is doing it right? If we think it like motorcycles, automotive, we, we talk often about the automotive industry and how we can maybe take some of what they're doing and apply it to the bicycle industry. What industry is doing it right in regards to service? I think, um, I, I won't say this is the industry doing it right necessarily, but we can pull great examples uh, consistently off of the automotive industry. Um, it, it acts as a really good common denominator and I think most people have had some sort of service experience in the automotive industry, be it good or bad. And we can contextualize those things uh, within our own service programs. Um, the, the really great examples that we can come up with uh, in terms of service, uh, profitability, customer experience, um, all of that stuff are, are really impactful, um, especially the ones focusing on uh, on customer experience. I think that's the impression that a lot of new uh, new cyclists are bringing into our industry right now. We've seen this massive influx of, uh, of new ridership. And, uh, and those people are coming in with automotive service as a context. And for us to be able to you know, go out and, and meet it and create good experiences that are consistent with, uh, with other industries' good experiences, I think, I think that's a really great place to look is, uh, is automotive. I would agree with Jeff. And I, I think part of that is it's a, it's a larger industry. It's a more mature industry. If you look at the average cost of the vehicles that people are buying compared to a bicycle, um, that industry was forced to bring a level of professionalism, a curated customer experience, in a different dialogue than what our industry or, or some similar industries have been presented with. And so, uh, you know, it, it has been discussed like the Lexus model or some of these other, you know, white glove experiences or, or ways to model your shop. Well, it's not necessarily from my point of view that we need to model against the automotive industry but learn from their lessons. They've been afforded opportunities to win and to fail. And can we extract those lessons and contextualize them within our industry and then apply them with our values, our ethos, our branding, so that we're still authentic, but the processes and the lessons have been developed and, and we can learn faster. Um, furthermore, I think Apple, as an example, is doing a really good job with service. Uh, as an example, personal example, you know, my iPhone 12 here, uh, I was riding in a hot rod this weekend that didn't have a floor in it and my phone fell out of my pocket and we ran over it. And of course it's like, oh no. Well, 
holy moly, the, the curated experience that I got when I walked into Apple and the level of reaching me how I wanted to be met was unbelievable. Like that's why I go, you know, whether you're into Androids or Apples, whatever, the, the service experience at, uh, at the Genius Bar was next to none that I've ever experienced. So I would say looking at, you know, real life examples similar to that that you live through um, would be another area that we should all be paying attention to. Excellent advice. And I just love the, the term genius bar also because it just sets your expectations. Like you're, you're already, you have already have, have a level that you would expect. And um, several podcasts as of late talking about these new customers that are coming into our industry and what their expectations are. They're coming from, you know, the Apple store. They're coming from their local auto store. And um, I, I just love this feedback. And I think there's a lot there. Um, okay, I'm going to skip to my next question. And it's very interesting. And I'm going to read it uh, verbatim here. It says, lots of veteran store owners and mechanics say that service is the future of our industry. Yet I'm still seeing a lot of stores that carry the full spectrum of products. This tells me that service is only part of the solution. What is the future of service in our industry? Pretty loaded question. Who wants to jump on that one? Yeah, absolutely. I'll jump on that one. Uh, so service is the future. Service in the future really rings well. And it's like that motivational like cheer that we can get behind. But if we think about it, service has always been here. It's been here since the dawn of time and the act of fixing or repairing or servicing your customer's needs. Like let's not even look at the bicycle itself, but the customer and are you providing a service to your customer has never gone away and it will always be here. It is going to be the root of bike shops existence, no matter what the, the, the commerce platforms or purchasing habits are in, in our industry. So, um, I'd like to just say it's not the future. It's already here and it's always been here. Um, now with that, I would go into more about customer experiences and say that they're more important than ever. And providing service is a critical component to delivering value adds to those customers. You build trust, you build rapport, you're problem solving through service so that you're, you know, as, as the retailer or the service department, you're curating memorable, great experiences that these customers have with their bicycles. People become less intimidated with their bicycle. They become more encouraged to go out and ride and enjoy why we all love bicycles. And that's really our duty as industry members is to lower barriers for people to go enjoy bicycles and service is always going to be a component of that. Furthermore, uh, if we look at it from a financial and a profitability standpoint, you're really uh, set up in a, a great position as a retailer with a service department to increase the lifetime economic value of the relationship you have with the customer. When you provide a great piece of service and a customer experience, the chances of them coming back are greater. Think about preventative maintenance and taking the opportunity to educate your customer on what future needs are so that when the bike starts making a noise or if something happens or the brake starts rubbing, it's not a, ah, oh, this bike broke again, but they knew that there was some maintenance that were that was going to come down the line. And you've now given that little bit of information, just like the automotive industry with the oil change sticker, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now they know to come back in and your service department is building that rapport and following through on a commitment you're making to them with the bicycles. So service departments will increase the lifetime economic value of that customer and repeat preventative maintenance and service will just add to the bottom line that that customer represents your business. Now, in order to deliver on that, you need product to be able to support them and whatever their needs are, whether it is a new bicycle or whether it's an accessory, a helmet, gloves, shorts so that the customer is comfortable on the bicycle. Yes, service is the root of being able to develop that relationship, that brand championship among uh, your customer base, but you have to be able to, you know, fulfill their needs with the products as well. And, and, and so, uh, yes, 
Service is the future. Yes, Surface is always here. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to carry a full spectrum of products or you have to at least have access to the products. And if you don't have it on your floor, well, it's really easy for your customer, well, maybe not right now, but in general, it's easy for a customer to find somewhere else to get it. And so do you wanna be that one-stop shop service provider, physical repair service or education or curating a great writing experience service? I would say look at what your customers are asking for and then, and then build that, um, that merchandising and that inventory strategy around exactly that so you're following through on their needs. That's all. Yeah, and I would, I would just add here, uh, I wanna echo what Aaron said about, you know, service has always been here. Um, the way that we're using service is so different now. Um, and if there's a core nugget to this, what I'm seeing is, we have a real opportunity to really focus on this part of business and make it as good as it possibly can be. Um, the maximizing the lifetime economic value of your customers um, is it's such an important part of that concept. Um, I, I would argue that there's there's no greater effect on customer service than service uh, than than bicycle technical service. Um, the customer's experience is, is really, uh, uh, really driven through the service department. And if we can get that into a good working state um, now, once we have opportunities um, in better supply chain and selling more, more bicycles, more parts, uh, our service department is just going to be that much sharper and will continue to be a, a really, really impactful part of our business moving forward. Yeah, we talk about curating the customer experience and, uh, you know, I'm going to go to my hair, um, the lady who does my hair because I love her and it took me like 20 years to find someone who's good. But now I've been with her for the past 10 years and I'm not going. I hope she never retires. And I feel like it's that with my bike mechanic. You know, we get a bike mechanic that we trust and that relationship is something that is so important to us. Um, and we continue to go back to that store and that mechanic for years and years and years. Um, that was I love that example, Heather. You do? I, I, I love that example, um, and you really sparked something for me um, on a personal level. And when I started to realize this customer relationship piece and, and why I'm in my role and kind of what my personal why is, um, it's around these experiences. And, and I had people follow me from shop to shop to shop. And that, that's a wonderful feeling as a mechanic and as an employee. Um, but I would want to challenge our industry and look at those experiences and ask, how do we transfer it from the person that has that relationship and that connection to our business and our culture? How do we serve our, our customers and our, our communities as a team, not as an individual? I mean, Maybe cutting your hair is a little bit different, but like, um, because there is that, that more intimate relationship, you know, the conversation, they get to know you better, where the mechanics are having conversations with your bicycle when they're working on it. But, you know, I, I think the team approach from the bicycle shop experience and that trust is really empowering because what if I'm on vacation or on sabbatical, you know, riding across the country or doing something cool, well, I want that customer to have the same experience from my peers and my teammates that they would for me. And I don't have to shelter that relationship. Oh, only Aaron works on my bike. That's, that's great, but we're only looking at half of the opportunity there. Let's make it, oh, my, this shop works on my bike and I only trust this business because their entire team are rock stars. And that's what I really want to inspire our, our industry to, to strive towards. Yeah, and I appreciate you flipping it because it is the team. It's the person who answers the call, you know, your phone, you know, it's the person you schedule with, it's the person who greets you when you pick the bike up, it is the team. So I'm so appreciative that you flipped that and spun that and I love that challenge. So <laughs> I hope everyone's listening. All right, let's dive into the next one. With some retailers that have been open for years, we're talking about evaluating the service department. What are indicators that it is time to change? And how do we go through those metrics? What are we looking at? How do we grow our service department? I'll, I, 
can jump on that to start out with. Um, that's a that's a hard question to answer just blanketly, right? There, it really depends on what level the retailer is at with their metrics. How intimate is the leadership team with the metrics and goals that they've set for the business and the performance of the business? I, I would say, um, you know, starting out looking at what your hourly labor rate is and how you established it. Uh, look at what your margin goals are for the business overall, and then how are you measuring those? Are they categorized? Do you have a margin goal for your service department? Do you understand how your hourly labor rate contributes to that margin goal for the business? Um, do you look at your staffing as a cost of goods sold for the business and start to uh, base your scheduling like you would inventory a product with mins and maxes and start to get really analytical about um, service uh, volumes coming in just like you would with sales projections. So depending on where the retailer is at, you would start with different pieces. So if you understand what your average margin should be, your, your margin targets are for the business, you understand the footprint that your service department takes, and you understand your staffing as a cost of goods sold, now I would start looking at uh, average time to complete services. I would look at process and efficiencies and go, are we, are we assuming that we're making the right uh, amount of margin and we're charging the right amount of money for our services? Uh, based on our performance and setting a standard of our performance to, to measure from or you know are we meeting or are we not and then look at the pricing model you have for your labor uh, and your service packages or your individual um, adjustments and do a market evaluation where are you on the scope of your competition and not base your labor off of what the competition is doing, but just to get a gut check of where you are at. Um, if you're priced higher than the competition by a significant amount, um, I would look at, um, you know, what are the, the value adds that you're providing your customers to justify that expense, right? Um, if you're higher priced in the market, and you're still not meeting your margin goals, as an example, well, I'd start to dig in and understand why. Are there, um, are there hurdles that your employees are seeing that you're, you're not aware of? Are there time commitments that, that you're not taking into account when you're setting your labor rates? And then there's a training opportunity with that. And so really digging into the financial metrics and the, the time investments you have to do these services and what services you're offering, you start to get control of all of that, then you can start to evaluate um, the performance of the business and when you should do an annual review. Yeah, there's so much. And honestly, Aaron, I never like knew this. I never looked at it so deeply until I started working with our P2 programs. And our P2 programs, those retailers use Retail Toolkit. And that allows us to look at what percentage of our revenue is coming from service monthly, year over year, we can look at the work order attachment ratio, we can really start to look at those numbers and we can see trends and know when we need to make changes. But I think unless you can, you know, you have to really analyze it, it's, it's really hard to have specific goals. I don't know, Jeff, what, what are you thinking here in terms of this conversation? Yeah, I think so. Two two things really come to mind. Uh, the um, the when do we need to do this? Like, what are the indicators? I I wouldn't wait for a clear indicator to say now it's time to do it. I would just make it a part of your process. You know, Aaron Aaron nodded to doing annual reviews of of uh, uh, of your metrics. Um, I think that's a really important thing to do because you know rent increases, how your mortgage changes. Um, utilities, all those things can play a part in how your service is priced and your hourly rate. Keeping an eye on your competition is always a really good thing to do. Um, so rather than wait for something to clearly say I should be doing this, just 
make it a part of your business process to, to do it and commit to keeping an eye on, you know, the, the pulse that, that you need to look at. Um, from a, a more practical point of view, one of the things that I've, I'm aware of is the tendency to give away service. And you do that, you know, with, uh, with some pretty clear examples. Every customer who buys a bike gets some sort of a service package for free. A um, little bit more invisible. Uh, how much time is your service department spending on new bike assemblies, for instance? And I know a lot of shops, um, these just sort of wash through the service department. When you're doing your, your reviews and looking at metrics, there's a huge black hole there that you don't get to see. And so, you know, how much value is your service department bringing to the business is just a, a, an invisibility that you, you can work to remove. Um, put line items on your, uh, on your P and L for, for new bike assemblies, establish a cost of goods sold, uh, that includes labor time, um, on that, on that bicycle, um, account for the time that you're installing fenders and, and, uh, uh, racks and any other accessories, um, remove the black holes from the, from the equation and, um, and start to see things a little more completely, uh, so that you're better equipped when you when you do your next review. We have a dog. Whose dog is that? <laughs> yeah, there's a dog nearby. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. No, Jeff, that's such a good point because we used to, you know, at our service store, um, give a, you know, if someone bought a fender, install it for free, or if someone bought a computer, install it for free. But we don't want to. We don't want to put no charge on that labor ticket. We want to actually account for that so we can realize what that number is. Um, this is great feedback for retailers, for sure. I think I don't think a lot of retailers are doing that, so we want to make sure. Yeah, that yeah it, it can be really easy to miss, and it's definitely not something a lot of businesses have muscle memory on. Um, but doing that gives you a more complete sense of, you know, the 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 total value of your service department. You can really correlate uh, the the minutes to dollars um, a whole lot more effectively once you start doing that. I would say from a customer service standpoint as well, um, you know, this isn't as simple as don't give away labor, right? I, I don't want to speak to the money that you're not bringing in because if you deemed that the value is there by waiving a fee for this, cool. You've accounted for that in your P&L. But the, the value of the service you need to maintain the integrity of. And when you see that there's a $79 value with a zero charge on it. Now the customer understands that that free tune-up actually is $80 to a customer that would not have, maybe didn't buy the bike from them. And so you're, you're holding the integrity of the knowledge that your staff has and the service you're providing at a high level. And customers get excited with that. You know, it's, it's, it's not as simple as just don't give away free labor. Well, no, give it away when it's appropriate, but account for it. Um, and then the bike assembly piece is one that really interests me because that's a cog against the, the sale price of the bicycle. If you have a 38 or 40 point margin bike, but you have a $40 assembly charge for your service department, well, that's not a 38 point or 40 point margin bike anymore because it costs you money to assemble it. And now you can get more accuracy on the performance of your sales team even just by accounting where the service department uh, engages with the rest of your, uh, your store. There's so much to this topic. I feel like we could just talk about these metrics. Um, uh, Frostbike, um, U of Q is service summit. You get deeper into these topics there. If retailers want to dive more into this more and want some, uh, you know, handheld guidance, I guess, if you would. Yeah, much deeper. Uh, Service Summit, we've got worksheets that walk you through calculating your labor rate, um, curating your service menu to actually be profitable and meet your customers' needs. Uh, there's some leadership training, there's some risk management training. Uh, yeah, and everything has a worksheet for the seminar so that you can walk through the lessons learned and apply it within your business. Yeah, all right, that's great to know, thank you. Um, Okay, this is going to be a deep dive question, and I'm just there. So many questions came in on staffing, um, onboarding new techs. You know, do we bring new techs on in this busy time right now? How do we keep them? 
very general, can you just dive into, you know, service techs, training, where to find them and how to keep them? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I realize that we're starting this in the middle, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of demand for mechanics out there and it's really hard to find people, uh, to work, uh, in bike shops. We've got shops that are underwater with repairs. Um, some are, are weeks out from customers getting their bikes. And, uh, and so the, the first place that I'd like to start with this question is really that, you know, what do we do right now? Um, and the, the answer is you, you got to get people in your business, especially if you've got a backlog of repairs. When we think about it from the lens of customer experience, um, the customer does not want to wait a month or six weeks uh, over the course of the summer to get their bike back in a, in a lot of cases they really want to they want they want to ride their bike when it's nice out and we got to make sure that they're they're getting the best out of us um, at that point when you hire mechanics you need to make sure that you're understanding number one you may not be getting uh, the most seasoned mechanics now because they're they're busy they're already employed um, you're probably getting somebody who's a little greener and to be able to call out core competencies what do you need these entry level mechanics to be able to do in your business? Um, and being really clear with that uh, from the beginning. Also think about training pathways. Where do you want these mechanics to go in the future uh, to support a, a sustained um, increase in business in your service department? I think that could be one of the most impactful mindsets that we have moving forward is not considering this a burst of, of business that we're gonna get that's gonna go away in the future but how do we train people into our service departments to maintain a high level of activity uh, through that part of our business? Um, I also think in the beginning, it's important to, to say we, we're, we can manage our expectations in our service department and it's a much better customer service to give realistic expectations to our customers. If we have customers coming in um, and uh, they're saying, you know, they want their bike. Uh, if we can't get our bikes out of the service department for another, another few weeks, uh, they need to understand that. They need to understand the backlog. Um, and it's okay to say no. Um, that's one of the things that I've, I've talked about with uh, some of our students here. If you don't have the bandwidth or the staffing to complete the repairs effectively with, with good quality, um, it's okay to say no, we're, we're full. Um, if, uh, if I try to find a new uh, doctor, I'll call around to doctor's offices and half the time it'll, they'll say, we're several months out from being able to even see new patients. You know, uh, that's a pretty well accepted model. I think customers really uh, would appreciate in the long run, uh, knowing that right off the bat that you're, you're slammed um, and uh, we can't get to you. Um, so that, that's really where I like to start that conversation is, what do we do now? Um, it's a bit of triage. Uh, what we do down the road, we need to prepare ourselves now as we're hiring to, to really sustain that and to make, uh, to make our expectations clear on our mechanics, uh, to make our expectations clear on our customers. And, um, and that's the best footing for a conversation there. Yeah, I'd echo what Jeff is saying and just having a, a candid look in the mirror and going explicitly, what are the roles and responsibilities? What are the measurable skills that can be evaluated on a, on a regular uh, schedule? And then what are the training needs to develop the skills to meet those explicit roles and responsibilities? The clearer we are and the more that we define and document um, even in a reactionary or responsive state like right now, we can set ourselves up for a more stable future and plan accordingly. Um, and then I would say this also then goes into staff retention. And, and something that I hear often is, you know, how do we retain shop staff in such a competitive labor market? And you know, are there benefits or there creative ideas on how we can keep people around? And, you know, I just want to bottom line everyone and 
and it's a livable competitive wage. And we hear this dialogue a lot, you know, pay mechanics a career-based wage, not a job-based wage. This is a skilled trade and a skilled labor. Um, and people's safety and, and life, lives are in our hands when we do these repairs. So we need to treat it professionally. And, and that's where we can look at the automotive industry, a more mature industry and say, what is the cost of living and what is the service and value that we're providing uh, now looking at the profitability and the sustainability of a service department and a small business we can't just invest more money more money has to come in uh, better efficiencies have to be created to be able to afford that and so i think there's really um there's really a dialogue that needs to start taking place. And, and that's, are you, is your service department performing enough to be able to afford the wages required to retain these top performing, you know, senior mechanics? Um, and if not, what are the processes that you need to implement into the business to be able to afford it? Uh, so there's that, I think, accountability on leadership and ownership of, of the businesses. On the inverse, there's also a dialogue on what explicit expectations and contributions need to come from those mechanics in exchange for, uh, for that higher salary or health benefits, et cetera. And I, I believe that these conversations um, and expectations need to be take place every year, every day in these businesses so that together we can grow. Um, because if mechanics want higher wages, they need to understand the, the levers that need to be pulled within the business and how they contribute to the sustainability, the viability of the business to be able to afford that salary that they're seeking. So it's a partnership. Um, yeah, I, I I'd love to jump in here and, and uh, say the, um, the quality of work is a real, um, is a real big part of this conversation. Um, and, and both in terms of being, being uh, confident that you're not going to have bikes go out of the business and come back that need to get fixed later. That's just, that's unacceptable. But in terms of, how do we do our work in the workshop? These are machines so you can make measurable call outs to, to the quality that you want to, uh, you want to produce in your workshop. And you can really clearly time through doing time studies on work. Uh, you can, you can time out those activities in your repair shop. It's it, this is all within a, a shop's leadership con control. And I would say, you know, engage your service manager, uh, maybe engage a senior mechanic on these exercises. And make sure that you've got a realistic appraisal of how long it takes you to do the work. That'll advise how much you should be charging for the work. If you're looking at everything uh, on the, uh, the shop's to-do list and valuing it, um, the, the wage justification should come in line with that. That's, um, that's a really important part of the relationship between business leadership and employees. Uh, having standards and expectations that the employees can work towards um, and then also having a you know an appropriate pay scale that that supports uh, a reliable quality of work but really looking at that work output what do you want to get out of your repair shop in terms of quality how long should these repairs take you uh, those are two things that can go into the mill that are really really important parts of the calculus it's something that i really want our service members to, to understand as service employees are the metrics and the effects that their decisions and processes have on the health of the business. When I was growing up in the bike shop since I was 14 years old, um, there were very loose expectations. Uh, I didn't, you know, back then I didn't grasp, well, if it takes me an hour and a half to build this bike because I want it perfect or wow, I, I watched this bike extra detailed because I really like the bike. Well, I'm actually losing the business money. Um, I can have all the certifications in the world. I could be, you know, fully trained up on S tech. I could be Bosch certified. Um, I could be the greatest wheel builder in the world, but if I don't understand 
the time investment equations and in really how to meet the financial needs of the business or charge appropriately, then I'm not worth what I think I am for the business. And that, that's a really hard conversation and hard realization to accept as an employee, but we need to have these candid conversations so that we can, as a team, contribute to a North Star and all have an investment in the health of the business. Because when the business is healthier, we're all healthier. And that's just a, a leadership mindset that I really want to inspire within our industry because if we have skin in the game and we understand that, you know, you don't make it rich in the, in the bike shop by, re, you know, uh, by, by not paying attention to these things, then we're all going to do better. This is, a, this is yeah, an exciting, I, yeah, Jeff, go ahead. I, I want to say also, there's a, this, this conversation I think has a domino effect and we can start just, you know, winging a lot of topics out here. But one of the things I think is very important to note is when you start getting back to, okay, let's get back to hiring and, and staffing up our service departments. Um, who, who is going to be available to work in our service departments right now? The quality is something that we can set out. We can, we can create expectations and work standards for every task on our service menu. Um, it's really just, you know, how we want to build the sandwich uh, that we're selling. Um, we have to understand that, you know, the, the people we're hiring um, need to be evaluated accordingly. So is this person a first year mechanic? Have they never worked in a shop and they need grooming? Um, we need to be able to allow that uh, time to mature, uh, whereas a more seasoned mechanic may, may have a little more proficiency to get stuff done the way we want it without being able to, um, you know, having to go back and explain it and train per se. Um, we just have to understand that the quality parameters are quality parameters. How we engage our employees needs to meet our employees with where they are in their career. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, the, the 10,000 hour metric, it takes 10,000 hours to, of, of deliberate practice to be a master at, at a task. Um, you know, that's a little over five years of full-time employment. So we really have to, um, we really have to keep that in mind that these first year mechanics uh, really need to have some clear and reasonable performance expectations that match the uh, the quality expectations and and workshop output. Um, that's that's a very important thing to recognize. I think here. Such an important conversation, and you know, if we if we go back, if you need the staff, you know, now is the time to hire them. But setting these benchmarks and with with um, clearly defined expectations and measurable skills are really important. Um, I don't remember having that in my in my service shop, but I think it's really important to go ahead and list it out. You know, have this have this data sheet in front of you of what you expect, and and let mechanics grow from basic mechanics to mid level. Are you both saying that it's okay for shops to you know have a mechanic who maybe is just responsible for cleaning and prepping the bikes, and then the bikes would go to a different mechanic just to give our retailers a little bit better understanding of what you're saying here? I, I think that. that businesses really have an opportunity to to do things that'll work for them. I mean, some, some businesses may have uh, the staffing to do that. They may be able to say, okay, we've got a, a, a entry level position here. That's going to clean bikes. It's going to be responsible for all of these tasks that are essential. Um, other businesses may not have the staffing for that and need somebody who can do everything it's the tasks that shouldn't be ignored. They, they need to be on the ticket somewhere, regardless of who does them. If you can get somebody into the business and provide a pathway for them to learn into uh, higher level roles, I think, I think getting them started um, doing the things that they can do is absolutely a, a, a good thing. Yeah. Aaron, were you gonna say something there too? Or? Yeah, I absolutely love when a business has that trajectory that an employee can grow in and it gives someone that, that motivation, that goal, like I want to grow into this position. It doesn't necessarily lean on like a financial piece, but just this 
a, a personal pride. I have developed into this mechanic from, you know, a bike builder, a bike washer. Um, just like there are career paths in so many other industries, let's start looking at what those are within, you know, our industry as well and service specifically. And, you know, we talk a lot about bringing more people into our industry, specifically, specifically the service industry. Is there anything that BBI or QBP is working on right now to, to bring more people into the service industry? Yeah, so right now we have the uh, Quality Bicycle Industry Scholarship Program, and we'll discuss that later this fall. Um, but we're really trying to find opportunities to bring new uh, young adults and, um, and a diverse pool of young adults into our industry and open up educational opportunities and then a network within industry employers um, as just our annual uh, program. Uh, Jeff can speak to some other stuff that the Institute is doing specifically. Yeah, so at the Institute, we've, we've had a really good relationship and our are really trying to continue to be supportive of programs like Project Bike Tech, uh, for instance, which is a uh, high school program uh, that is working on bringing vocational training back into high schools. They're doing it through the lens of bicycle mechanics. Um, and we're, we're supporting them uh, every way that we can now because I, I think that, that is, that's such an important thing to do uh, on a lot of levels on a industry workforce level, this is really where it, it starts. Um, the, uh, the other programs that we're working with, uh, we're finding new, new ways of reaching out to nonprofits and, uh, and working with community organizations that have uh, training programs within that community. And we know, you know we're not gonna get 100% of those, uh, those organizations that'll send people to work in the industry but it's really about providing the connective tissue to let, let people know uh, this is a career path, you can take it, um, there's something beyond this, uh, this basic level ed education um, that you can connect into uh, if you wanna work in the bicycle industry. So really those, uh, trying to put our feelers out and, and making sure that we're engaged with, with agencies that are doing training in communities is, is a really important thing to us right now. I love that you brought up Project Bike Tech. I was just talking, is it Mercedes, like, like last week or something, and the program's amazing, and it's really bringing um, service technician training right into schools. So if you haven't looked yes. at Project Bike Tech, I would definitely do that, yeah. Yeah, Project Bike Tech is a really, I, I think it's a really important program, and one of the great things about it is how, you know, accessible it is. If it's not in your community, you simply just, you need to convince a school to open one, um, and uh, and they've they've got a great great package and training for it. So it's I, I can't say enough good things about Project Bike Tech. Yeah, the MBBA is going to definitely be behind their efforts and promoting it to our so look for more information on that. Um, I have a really a basic question, I guess, that came in just about tools. Uh, one of our retailers asked us uh, shop owned tools versus mechanic owned tools which is fairer, which is more efficient, which is more profitable? Um, I, Aaron and I saw that question earlier and we kind of went around and around with it. Um, I'll, I'll say empirically right off the bat, uh, a shop should, should be prepared to have their own tools at their own tool stations. Um, we recommend uh, workstations uh, in your workshop that are tooled identically. Um, so that your staff can move from bench to bench with a lot of efficiency. They don't have to relearn where every, every tool is on the bench. It's all always in the right spot. Um, I think it is a, not a reasonable expectation for new mechanics to be expected to spend a whole lot of money on tools. Um, so it, at, at surface level, I would absolutely recommend a shop just invest in the tooling um, and, uh, and maintain that, that tooling profile on all of your, your workbenches. Make sure they're consistent and, uh, and that you can increase your staff or move staff around from station to station without compromising efficiency. Uh, the other side of it is that I spent 
uh, a lot of my career uh, as a race mechanic working out of my own toolbox that I had organized myself to, you know, my own efficiencies. Um, I'm pretty sure Aaron can, you know, tell the same story. If you have a mechanic that would rather work out of their own toolbox and they're proving that it's, it's more effective, I, I think that that's great, but I wouldn't place it as, you know, an expectation that they have this or they can't work on, you know, in your workshop. Um, so th that's, that's my answer there. I think there are advantages to both sides, but preparing for mechanics who can't buy their own tools is going to be the best thing. Thanks, Jeff. It, it's such a fun one. I remember like color coding the tools to keep them on the workbench and they <laughs> things go missing. And um, I appreciate that response. And yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, lots to think about there. Um, I had a recently in one of our Monday member mingles who was really excited that he just transitioned his service shop from paper tickets to a paperless system. And it got our conversation in the meeting talking about point of sale systems and which might be best for writing service. And is the question paper versus paperless, you know, which is better? Can we just dive into that conversation a little bit? Uh, definitely a broad question, but I think there's a lot there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, in all honesty, we're living in a paperless world right now and technology is a beautiful thing. And so if we first start off with service experiences and is a paper or a paperless system going to provide a better experience for the service, um, I'd start off by saying that the business is responsible for setting those expectations of experience and if technology is available and they're embracing technology, then developing process to implement that technology appropriately uh, so that it meets the experience standards that you've set for the business. Um, so I, I don't believe that there is a, a benefit for paper or uh, electronic uh, from ex an experience standpoint just because it's paper or electronic. Now, um until we start looking at what other industries are doing the expectations that customers are coming to us with um back to my iphone example i made an appointment uh on my backup phone because my current phone is broken uh, i got a text message uh, confirming the time and then i got a receipt with the everything that was being uh, estimated and then at the end a receipt of my invoice, that's pretty amazing. And then there's nice reminders that come say, hey, by the way, this is, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, these are what you declined and these are what you accepted. You know, that's just an arbitrary example. So I, I think you can build um, new capabilities that the rest of the world is setting as just a standard or a benchmark to, to compete against. Um, we're not competing against each other. We're competing against the Apple Store, Best Buy, um, heck, Bite Squad, because we want to order food and, and we don't want to make a telephone call anymore. So um, you, you have to look at what you're trying to achieve and what experiences you want to deliver, and, and that should inform you know, what technologies you use. From a uh, efficiency and from a reporting or tracking standpoint, uh, there's a lot less liability with technology nowadays than paper. Um, let's say you have a filing cabinet with all of your paper tickets in the basement uh, under a pipe and the pipe bursts and now all of the paper is soaked wet. Well, you know, you wouldn't have that if all of your records are on, in the cloud and stored. Um, anymore. And so is there an archivable record keeping piece that is becoming more, ever more important? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I am all in on, on a paperless system and just encourage retailers to understand why they want to use it and how they want to use it to meet their customers' needs and how they want to position themselves in the market. Yeah, from the record keeping, I think someone even mentioned that they're able to take photos of like the bike when it comes in or maybe some accessories that are on the bike and they have documents. So when the people come back to pick up the bike and they're like, oh, 
learn what's a lock on there, but you already have pictures, you know, stored. So there's other things too. Um, Jeff, any thoughts about paper versus paperless and uh, point of sale systems and any, anything in that regard? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I, I understand if a business is just not ready to invest in, uh, you know, computers and, and software, um, that makes sense to me, but I don't think there's a real practical advantage to sticking with paper. Um, if you're not able to, to you know, digitize your, your service experience or your, your POS, um, I would really think hard about the future and uh, how this could be a priority in your decision making moving forward, because I, I think that we're going to see um, more and more of this as an expectation from customers. Um, the, you know, I'll echo what Aaron said about the liability of a paper ticket and it, it goes beyond, well, what if I have an incident in my, in my business? It's really the day to day of how you're using them is how many people on staff have really good handwriting that everybody can read. Um, I've read plenty of repair tickets. That I have no idea what the notes say because I just can't read the handwriting. Um, we can fix that immediately with, you know, a computer-based uh, system. Um, going back and retrieving records if it's put in the wrong spot um, really, really puts the workflow at risk. Uh, and I think there's a whole lot more back and forth uh, between people in your shop, finding tickets, reading tickets, all that, you know, practical nitty gritty stuff that, that you just don't have as an issue if you use a pay or a, a digital ticket system. Um, so short answer, I, I don't really see any advantages to sticking with paper, um, but I do understand that uh, that some shops may not be able to afford an upgrade at this point, um, but I would, I would look very, very hard at that as a priority for your business. Excellent feedback. Um, all right, let's dive into the next topic that we have here, and it's about pricing. Um, you know, the long scan, basic tune, full tune, deluxe tune, some retailers are asking, should they go a la carte pricing? Um, any, any tips or feedback for retailers there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I believe it starts with some market research and understand what your customers are asking for. Um, look at uh, a couple different indicators here. So look at what the competition is doing, not to base your decision off it, but just to have a heightened awareness of what your community is offering from a service standpoint. Look at the bikes you're selling. What are the bikes that are on your floor and the technologies involved? Um, that will be a future facing indicator of what services will come. Look at the um, top 20% of the bikes you've sold over the last three years. That should be a current indicator of what services presenting itself now. And then do the same for your services that you offer. Are there a la carte services that are high volume, high dollar amount? Are there packages that are you've sold the most of? That will give you an indicator of what, um, what packages or services you're already offering versus what are not. So you just take a, a candid look at like, okay, what are we selling? And then what is going to come in and what technologies uh, should you embrace? And then start to make candid decisions about like, okay, uh, are we going to intentionally call it a tune-up or are we going to call it a service package? Because I think we get into this naming issue where tune-up is a tune-up is a tune-up and then now you can be price shopping. And so what is unique for your business and what are the services you want to offer to meet the needs that your customer base is asking for? Again, with all those metrics that you measured previously, uh, because you can then price it to your your needs of the business and not have to say, oh, our tune-up is $49.99 and the shop down the street is also for, uh, is $32.99. Well, likely it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of what services you're offering. So um, while I don't think a la carte is necessarily the most efficient, I would look at you know, candidly, what are the packages and components that you're offering within that package um, so that you're pricing it accordingly and adding value to your customer where it's needed. All right, let's yeah. get specific let's... in a minute. I'm sorry, Jeff, I just got something. I, I didn't tell you guys I was going to hit you with this one. All right, go ahead. 
All right. What about a flat, uh, repairing a flat on a base, on a regular bike, we'll call it acoustic, versus an e-bike? Um, we know it takes a little bit longer, especially if it's a rear flat or whatnot. Do we charge the same, like is a basic flat repair the same price or do we have a separate e-bike menu? I think that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think e-bikes are a great example, but they're not the only example out there. Um, there. There are a lot of bicycles that have layers of complication uh, around some pretty simple tasks. I think with those, um, you're talking about, you're not talking about necessarily all typical class one e-bikes with mid-drive motors. Those wheels come out roughly the same as, as every other bike. I think what you're talking about are e-bikes that have hub drive motors that have wires that go to the back. Um, they may have torque arms that have to come off of the bike. Absolutely, you want to account for the time there. Um, uh, and I, it's totally okay for a shop to make a decision on, you know, how they're going to be pricing tasks like this. My, my kicker is always make sure you can justify the cost with clear dialogue that anyone in your business can can speak to so if your customer says oh i see your you know flat repair is only 10 bucks why are you going to charge me 15 you can say well you know our flat repair for regular bikes is based out of you know through axles or quick release skewers um, without any peripheral attachments and here are all the peripheral attachments you have on your bicycle um, i i think that that's a totally fine thing to do as long as you're able to place it in reality from a, a time to dollars point of view and uh, and your your business employees know how to speak to it effectively. Yeah, I would say it's all in the transparency that you offer your customers, right? Get it if you have a service menu, put that on the service menu so that it's very clear why it's there and it's not this imaginary fee that you're, you're charging uh, for that particular customer so they don't feel targeted. Uh, the other thing is look at different technologies we're already embracing. Tubeless tires and, and setting up a tubeless tire is not the same as a flat fix. And we charge drastically different amounts to offer that service. So it, it's already sort of embraced within our service department. We just need to look at it at a higher level. Um, and I guess the other piece I would say is that if a customer with one of these bicycles is not willing to spend, you know, the extra five or ten dollars because that's what you deemed it needs to charge, it's okay to let them walk out. And that's not an, a, a popular opinion, right? But if you, as a business, take in bad services that you're losing money, you're not fulfilling the needs to your employees, to the business, and that's gonna get you into a really bad situation in the future. So if someone else is willing to do it for less, let them go to the bottom, maintain your integrity, maintain the, the high level of service and culture that you're developing, and, um, and there's always gonna be somewhere else that the customer might not want you know, to choose you, and that's okay. Spend the yeah. time with the customers that are willing to invest in you. I think this is a really good opportunity for us to loop back into uh, some of the things we talked about at the beginning of the conversation where um, we're, we're talking about how often should you check in or what are my indicators on checking in on the health of my service department. There are a couple of really clear examples here that we're not necessarily talking about the metrics of the business, but we're talking about what is the work that the business is doing. And, um, and if we've got different service categories coming in all the time now, the tubeless example is a great one. Uh, you know, flat fixes don't look the same that they used to uh, across the board. There, uh, there are different technology categories that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis now. You need to check in on those things and make sure that the stuff that you're working on still meets you know, the, the service menu uh, in a consistent way. And if it doesn't, um, how are you going to change your service menu to, to reflect those, you know, actual task items that you're doing? Yeah. Another item that is coming into the shop are bicycles now and how the service techs are left to charging for a bike assembly. Um, the question is, what's a good rate for this? 
Um, and just any advice you have there for shop owners um, with all you know bicycles coming into the store that need to be assembled. Yeah, so there's a, I, I heard several years ago, um, a lot of dialogue around this where shops were, yeah, they were pretty offended that people were buying online and then bringing into their businesses for work. Um, my response is pretty consistent now to what it was back then, but I think there's a lot more realness to it uh, today. Um, do the work. Your, your service department is there uh, to do that work. That work has a, a time component to it and just make sure it matches up with your, your hourly rate and your service menu. I don't suggest that businesses upcharge people for bringing in bikes that, they, uh, that they've bought online. Um, I think that if you make it, you know, a real pricing on your service menu, um, you may have one or two or three uh, grades of assembly, depending on what kind of a bike it is that's coming in. Um, just make it consistent with how your service department does business. I say do the work, you know, all the time, because again, we're not talking about a single service that a customer is there for. We're talking about really nurturing that lifetime economic value of the customer and making sure that they have a really good reason to come back. Um, and, and, uh, their experience on the bike is excellent. So that's, that's the, the, the answer I've had for quite some time on that question. But I think now a lot of people are experiencing it, um, in more real terms. So yeah, the mindset. definitely doing the work. Yeah, the mindset has definitely changed. We have a customer, let's keep them now in our shop for sure. Um, yep. uh, one other question, and I, and I hate to keep it around pricing, but I, I, I want to make sure I get this question in um, for the retailer who asked it, is just thinking about raising your rates. You know, so, some shops are, I hate to say, taking advantage of the times, but realizing that um, maybe it's a good time to look at their rates and adjust them if necessary. Um, we talked prior about that being part of your basic planning and you should know what your rates are, but um, any tips here, you know, looking at, is this a good time to raise rates? Is it always down to, um, you know, not maybe the, the reviews, um, but more of the experience that you're offering? Uh, just anything here you could provide. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say you have to be able to justify why you're raising your rate, right? Did your, um, did your costs go up? Uh, is it just cost of living increases? Uh, are, did you develop a new capability and so now you're offering something above and beyond? You're, you're meeting you know, a special niche or this very high level of, of customer experience that no one else is doing, right? Those are quantifiable, measurable reasons to do it. I would say raising your rates just to arbitrarily raise your rates is a dangerous act and you can't speak to why. If someone, if someone asks, well, wh why did the rate go up from yesterday when I was in your business, you know, um, you should be able to at least have a, an, an answer for that and a, a planned answer for that. So I, I would say absolutely do not shy away from, you know, um, charging a fair rate for the service you're providing. Uh, an example I'll use really quick that I discuss in a lot of my seminars I teach uh, is around A brands. So an A brand is like a premier brand. Um, if your shop is a premier brand in your community and you offer a service that no one else does or this like curated amazing experience above and beyond what everybody else is, you have pricing power up. And what that means is you can charge a premium for the service that you're offering because it's unique and people want it. It's, it's a desirable uh, uh, commodity that people are seeking out. It's why a Porsche costs more than a Volkswagen, even though a lot of Volkswagens have the same parts that the Porsche has underneath. And so it's that premium experience. And if you indeed are offering that premium piece and people are willing to pay for it, take pride in it and charge accordingly but just your general you know rate changes put it on an annual schedule or every two years so that you can really measure the performance if you keep reacting or responding with price changes you then are confusing the reporting 
and you can't have a candid evaluation of how your business is performing. So um, I like to put some consistency into those rate changes so that it's intentional uh, and, and planned for within the business planning cycle that you should be going through. That's good insight. Um... I'm just thinking, you know, I'm thinking about um, pricing. I'm thinking work order attachment ratio. I'm thinking about the parts needed, how some retailers aren't selling chains or tubes. They're keeping them for their service department repairs. Uh, can either of you speak to how the current state of supply has impacted tech departments? Anything that retailers should be aware of there? Uh, yeah, that's a, I mean, th I think that's tough for a lot of people. Um, I would say number one, the, the maybe more of the touchy feely answer is um, you're not alone. Everybody's experiencing difficulties and, um, and it's okay to come up with solutions um, for these problems. You, you, uh, you hear about bike shops that can't get inner tubes and so they're patching tubes for customers. It's totally fine. As long as, the, the work is sound and the patch holds, it's totally okay. Your customer needs to know that's what you're doing um, so that you know they, they understand the hows and whys of your process and that they don't think they have a new inner tube in their tire. That's part of that transparency piece. But coming up with a solution that responds effectively to the supply chain challenges is, I think that's, not only is it okay, I think it's essential right now. And just thinking about the situation that we're in after the past 18 months, techs are working long hours. Um, is there anything that you're seeing that retailers in their service shops have implemented that, that, it, that they've done that's really working, that's really stand out um, that maybe we weren't doing pre-COVID? I think that that one, that one's also another, that's a creativity answer. And, um, really addressing what are the challenges that we're seeing and what do we need to do to, uh, to prioritize and, and uh, start applying solutions. I've heard a lot of things. I won't say one thing is better than another that shops are doing, but they're, uh, in a lot of cases, bike shops are compartmentalizing the mechanics uh, time and workload um, a lot more effectively. Uh, I've even heard of some businesses, they'll, they'll close their retail storefront um, a couple of days a week to allow their service department to simply work and to do the work that's making them money now. Um, scheduling has become a really big point for a lot of businesses. Uh, how do we schedule effectively around a realistic bandwidth um, based on our staff? Uh, I just want to express, you know, it's it's totally okay to to come up with solutions um, as long as there's a good justification for it. Think outside the box and uh, and find things to do that that work for you. Um, there's nothing that says you have to, you know, keep uh, your old processes if they're not working right now. Um, doing the work effectively with quality is really the bottom line here and making sure the customers have good experiences walking out of your store. Um, those are the, the two things that are most important. I'd say the best retailers are the ones that have found comfort in trying new ideas, even in the face of failure. And when they do fail, it's not necessarily a failure, it's looked at as a learning lesson. And they fail fast and they move on to the next idea. And having that culture within your business that you plan for some potential failures, uh, that's how growth is developed and new capabilities and processes are implemented. And if retailers have embraced that over the last 18 months, I do believe that they're coming out of this in a much stronger position. And when the supply chain levels out, um, they're going to be more efficient and they're gonna be even more uh, profitable in the long run. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, just this past week, I heard of a couple of shops that are unfortunately um, going to be closing because of their lack of having bicycles to sell, lack of money coming in. Um, I'm seeing the service center as a, an area that we can definitely focus on. 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking we have to engage our customers, maybe reach back out with ser service reminders, focus on the fixed costs like rags or any other components you're using in the service shop. Um, and not to be a dead horse here, but Aaron and Jeff, I'd ask each of you one last time, is there anything that you think retailers should be focused on now? Like one specific item, if you would, or something to just make sure that the service area can be a source of revenue um, to keep the shop afloat. If you don't know your metrics, take the time, even if it's at night after a long day at, at, at the shop. I, I understand that that sounds a little daunting, but take the time to understand your metrics. Take the time to understand what you need to produce and, and come up with a plan to measure it. And you will find that it's going to turn into a game of chess and you'll be able to intentionally move the pieces uh, and watch the business respond um, I would say that is the most valuable thing I, I can ask someone to do. I would say keep in mind the customer experience and the, the durability of that experience um, at, always in the front of your mind. Um, make decisions accordingly in your workshop with the how are you going to do your work and uh, and what are you are you going to do? Um, make sure that those you know the the hows and whys and whats are linking to customer experience really really deliberately. Um, this is a it's an excellent time to try new things. Um, it's an excellent time to get new people working in the industry. Uh, I would say make sure that as a person running a service department your decisions are deliberate and the work you do is really, really deliberate and focused on quality and customer experience. That's fantastic. I, I can't thank you both so much for sharing your insight, for taking your time to read through these questions to you know, pre prepare for our conversation today. Um, if anyone listening or watching has any questions for Aaron or Jeff, you could send them to me at, at heather at mbda.com and I will connect you with Aaron and Jeff. Um, Aaron will be joining us at the Big Gear Show, uh, leading a seminar there. So thank you, Aaron. Um, anything more, Aaron or Jeff, anything coming up with QBP or BBI that you would like to share with our listeners or viewers before we go? Uh, November, we'll have our upcoming uh, UFQ Service Summit. So a lot of, I, I said, the, the topics we discussed will go in depth there um we're planning our upcoming uh, frostbite business summit for february um so more information coming out on that uh later this fall uh, and like you mentioned i'll be at the big gear show and really look forward to any conversations that come uh following that seminar as well so thank you for having me and taking the opportunity to discuss such an important and, and passionate topic yeah thank you very much Definitely. And, you know, if you want to learn more about QBP, you can visit them online at qbp.com. Um, so I guess I'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. And uh, with this, we go. All right.